Hello, friends on the internet. I am thrilled to be here today with the director, screenwriter, and one of the producers of Dirty Towel, uh, Kelly Car Carpentieri. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Carpentieri. Yeah. Car Carpentieri. Uh, the short film features a teenage girl who, after having sex for the first time, grapples with feelings of shame and guilt. For those who are going to be in New York, Mark Tribeca 2024, you can catch it on this Friday, June 7th at 9.15 p.m. at AMC 19th Street, uh, Monday, June 10th at 8.45 p.m. at the Village East Angelica, Saturday, June 15th at 8.30 p.m. again at the AMC 19th Street, and a final screening on Sunday, June 16th at 9.15 p.m. also at AMC 19th Street. Kelly, uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So first things first, uh, let's get into the basics. Uh, what inspired the short? Yeah, so the idea for the short film came about in March of 2023 when I was having a conversation with my cousin and co-writer Emma Parks about kind of the social stigma surrounding women's sexual experience and kind of about our own experiences. And as we talked, we kind of found the commonality between them and in our shared experiences and start talking to friends and family and kind of just found that there was this universal feeling that a lot of women had regarding shame regarding their sexual experiences. And then Emma's friend shared a story about how her mom used the metaphor of a dirty towel as a way to teach her about, you know, sex. And once we heard that metaphor, we instantly knew like, this is a short film. This is something we wanted to make, something we want to talk about. And it just kind of spiraled from there into what it became. Yeah, I was going to ask what the, uh, where the title came from. So, um, yeah. So yeah, um, and then leaping off of that, um, how did that evolve from like this idea into over the course of production and so on? Yeah, so we had started with knowing the kind of themes we want to talk about, but the actual story of it has definitely evolved since we first created it. We were really interested in telling the story through this kind of generational shame lens between a mother and a daughter passing this idea down as a form of like protection. So originally in our first concepts, we thought, okay, we'll make them dual protagonists. It'll be both of their stories in the short film. And, you know, we always had this idea for like the longer feature as well. But as we started writing and developing it, we realized that actually for the short, I think it'd be better if we just focus on Charlie, the um, teenage girl's journey herself and kind of hint at the mom's journey. But once we decided to focus on that, it kind of just, we just went really deeper into like, the experience that she was having herself and jumping off of that i know you said you didn't want to turn it into a feature but is there a roadmap where you say hey this short did really well at tribeca we'll we'll make it into a feature someday oh yeah sorry if i uh misspoke we actually do we'd have written the feature we okay. did just turn it into a feature after we just decided that we wanted to start with the short film test the concept see the world and then build it up from there so our hope is, yeah, if it does well at Tribeca to make the feature film for it. Um, I think there's still a lot to explore within the world and within these themes and these characters. So, yeah, it's something that was really fun for us to do after completing the short was kind of dive into that next step. Yeah. And then going back to something you said before, I, I imagine this was a pretty collaborative process. So uh, how did that collaboration work and how did that contribute to shaping the short we're going to see at Tribeca 2020? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So uh, my co-writer is actually my cousin, Emma Parks, and I had never written anything with anyone else before um, mm -hmm. or had a collaboration of this level before we decided to do this project together. And what I learned is, you know, having someone there who's tackling these issues with you who's developing the story with you made it a much more collaborative process a much more fun process sure. for us both um and we're we talk all the time we're very different in the things that we usually lean towards so I usually lean towards like more drama and she usually leans towards more comedy and I think putting both of our ideas and experiences into it kind of became this melded you know comedic drama like of the story and I think kind of really gave it the heart and humor that it needed you know I decided well I'd always wanted to be a direct and she is you know pursuing acting so it kind of naturally after writing fell into those other roles and right. I think what really helped it work is that we just have a really strong trust between us and a really strong you know ability to you know trust that the other person's going to do their job well and you know work together um throughout the entire thing yeah and i think that's important especially in a short like this uh where i think you're being very emotionally vulnerable too in the drama aspects of it so um and kind of speaking of that how did 
the actors approach their roles, you know, particularly in balancing the comedic elements with the, the, I I believe you use the word, not, I don't want to use the word guilt, but the more dramatic elements of it. So I was very grateful to have actors that were willing to try things out with us on set. Um, They all kind of brought their own personality and their own experiences into each role, which is something you just can't really even put on the page. They just brought it to life in ways that I didn't even imagine possible. And I think on set, because, you know, I wasn't sure totally which moments we're going to need a little bit more likeness and which moments we're going to need a little bit, lean a little bit more each way. We honestly, for a bunch of different takes, try different things where we were like, hey, why don't we try it this way? And that way it might be a little lighter. Okay, let's try it this way. And they were so great and so flexible with, you know, just trying different performances, doing different things. And ultimately, that's why I feel like you can see the nuances in their performance so well is because they really went into each moment and we picked and like handpicked the editor and I uh, which moments we're going to piece together the tone of the story. Yeah, a lot of a lot of yes ending. Yeah. But um, talking about the editing, you're just creating my transitions for me. That is great. Uh, could you discuss the creative decisions behind the, the cinematography and the editing uh, process? Yeah. So I'll start first. The cinematography. I came first. Um, so yeah. I worked really closely with our cinematographer, Emily Ford, in creating the kind of look that we wanted for the story. We were really inspired by a lot of coming of age stories that just felt very authentic and real and kind of nostalgic in a way that a lot of people can relate to. But because we had that kind of element of emotional realism in those moments of Charlie's panic and fear um, and flashbacks, we actually found this like lens effect that she put over that Sorry if there's a siren. No, um, no worries. That kind of gives it like a little bit of like a glimmer, a softer feel. It's like very subtle, but it's if you can see it, you'll notice it. And yeah. I think that really helped in those moments that are a little bit more heightened by her emotional state. Um, but otherwise very focused on, you know, just making sure that it felt like we were in this experience with her. That kind of carried over into the editing with our editor, Jesse Rojas. She was incredible. She knew the story almost as well as I did. Like we would have these hour long conversations about each scene and what it meant for each character and why we needed a few frames more of her, a few less frames of this and the shifts that it would have. Like we, she was so good about really going into the nuance of like what it would do to the story. And I think that was just really helpful to work with. And in fact, there were certain scenes like the mirror scene and the shower scene that uh, Emma and I had an idea of how we wanted it in the script, wrote it, obviously, with Emily, shot a bunch of different, you know, those were a lot of, let's hold the camera and let's just go forward and try a bunch of different things and pull stuff. But Jesse edited it one way, and it was completely different than I had thought, and I loved it. And it was, like, perfect. And I think that's one of those things that I learned, like, yeah, you really have to kind of let the creativity of your team go and see where it leads them and see what the story speaks to them. And that's how you get a really collaborative final product. Yeah, of course. I I think there's a quote out there of um, saying, I I don't remember the exact quote, but it's like the story is created in in the editing room, like the final story. Yeah. If anyone knows where that came from, let me know. I know Um, the quote, stories told in three parts. It's like the writing, the production and the editing. I don't know who said it, but I definitely learned that quote before and it's so true yeah i remember it being bandied about right around the time mad max fury road was coming out because how that was edited but getting more into technical aspects i'd love to hear about the uh production design in terms of uh creating that atmosphere and tone uh, of film yeah so in regards to production design um i worked with our production design bridget on a lot of mostly the color scheme of the film was we were very particular about making sure that the colors that the characters were in and just the world around them kind of fit throughout um because i do think color does tell a story in itself yeah i mean look at um great gatsby oh yeah i love great gatsby that like yeah like color just tells so much about a story too and i feel like for in instances like for charlie like we kept her in a lot of these like blues and that was you know a color that we chose for the symbolic meaning of like what she's going through and the vulnerability in the color blue whereas like for elizabeth it was kind of different and 
you know, I think also for the production design, we really wanted to make sure that the scenes felt lived in, that the spaces that we were in felt lived in. So the entire art team, I always say, I go back to how they did Charlie's room, older and younger Charlie's room. They completely transformed it from what it was. It was, you know, completely white walls. They put everything up and really brought it to life. And I think when you have things like that, the production design, sometimes people often overlook it, but that's how you can feel immersed in a story is if you're not questioning, oh, is this space real? What do they do for this? If you can just feel like you're in their room, that's, you know, important. And I think because we were so specific about the colors and the choices, like hopefully it feels cohesive in its theme and its feel of the film. Yeah, and I, I do think production design is an underrated part of making a film because say, you know, just to, because we were talking about Mad Max earlier, if the sets didn't look like they did, you wouldn't believe it's in an apocalypse. If it, if it looked like, you know, how, how it looks right now, how my area looks right now, nobody would believe this is like decades into an apocalypse. They would just think, oh, this guy bought an RV off of Craigslist and called it good, you know? So, so yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And then, um, Lastly, for the technical aspects, uh, I'd love to hear musical influences. Like, what was your mixtape for this mo- uh, for this uh, short? Yeah, that's a great question. I love talking about the music because we had a phenomenal composer, Roslyn, come on to the project. I am the first to say I love music, but I'm not musically inclined. It is very me hard either. for me to totally picture what I want for a scene, which I know is sometimes the hardest thing for <laughs> composers and people to know. And I remember I was like, it's so tough because I just know when I hear it, I hear it. Like, I know it's right when I hear it. And thankfully, Ross was so great about trying different things. And she had some ideas of her own. So we really liked for Charlie's panic scene, which you hear in like the shower scene in the grocery store aisle. She Mm -hmm. pulled a lot from like kind of that white lotus sounding feel where it's very like because sex is like a very she was saying like a very primal theme it's a very you know animalistic type thing so bringing in those like primal sounds and more like tribal sounds like is what you know she leaned into that and it's something I never would have thought of and I think it works so well and then for other scenes such as like the same we had a lot of cues that kind of go hand in hand with other scenes so what you hear in the mirror scene is actually what you hear in the laundromat later and those had more since and also we decided that charlie's instrument was going to be the violin so there's like hues of violin in each of the songs that are for charlie to just kind of give it like an extra layer of like the sim- symbolism with her and she i don't even know where she pulled that from but it was beautiful once i heard it and i think she just did such a great job you know tailoring each song to what we were seeing on screen to every single beat so i was really greatly grateful for that and i love what she did yeah agreed i think uh tribeca should put together like a playlist of all the music in uh these films are like you know inspired by playlists on spotify that would be great because this is probably what the third or fourth interview i've asked about music and you know it 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 seems to be a theme this year that a lot of people are going on spotify and listening to like for fire fucking fire it was the yeah yeah yeah's and local uh, santa fe musicians so so yeah Um, Um, and to see that yeah yeah it's it's great you should check it out but um but just make sure i thought but i'd love to hear about um any i guess challenges you had on the set or during the production process? Yeah. So production is definitely, I think, out of all the stages, definitely the craziest. And I think for us, one of the things that was a challenge that I also learned a lot from was, um, you know, a lot of the places that we filmed in were real businesses, which meant that we were shooting in them after hours. So at night, starting at, you know, 8 or 9 p.m. until 2 a.m. And because of that, we had very short windows of time in those spaces. I remember like the first night we shot the laundromat scene and we only had like four hours in there. And I think, you know, looking back, I'm like, wow, like, you know, you really need to be on it. Everybody needs to be like really helping each other and working together to make sure that you get it done, especially because you don't have other time. And I think for the grocery store where we had all the extras come in, all these different moving parts, I was just so grateful for the 
team that was helping, you know, with everything. We had all hands on deck. Everybody was doing stuff in there. And, you know, I think what we learned is, you know, it's definitely if you're going to be shooting in a space where one, you can't test you and two, you have a limited time just to make sure that everybody is like prepared. Everybody knows what they're doing for the Emily and I, our DP, we were, we knew we had to know those shots, like every single shot we wanted to get and how we wanted it to look, even though we had never been able to test it. And so it was a lot of on the fly stuff, a lot of being flexible and, you know, altering things as needed to make it go. But ultimately, like we got it done and I think it looks great. But yeah, definitely a learning experience shooting in like places like that. Yeah. Did you ever get like into a place where you're like, ah, maybe the camera doesn't fit here. So we're going to have to figure out a way to maneuver this. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we, oh gosh, I remember the tightest place I think that we filmed in was um, in the shower scene. It was a small bathroom, a small shower. And it's like Emma, our lead and like the camera. And like, I'm like squatting outside the door and it's like people are running cables and of course the water it's water so like the camera has to be protected and yeah it was um it was definitely a tight squeeze in there for sure we had to change a little bit of how we were thinking things yeah it, uh it's interesting you mentioned it, the shower scene because um a few weeks ago I think um uh, one of the cinematographers on what was it what was, what's the latest season of american horror story delicate there's like a shower oh. scene in there and he talked about like shooting in the shower and what he had to do oh my gosh. the test shoot yeah. he had to do I, re- I recommend checking that out i forget what i forget who it is but uh if you find it uh i, I recommend it because yeah I'll definitely look at that. because it's really insightful to see how just how people shoot in small spaces like that i know to talk about another tribeca short fire fucking fire again uh, they're talking about having to use the mirror, like to shoot into the mirror to just yeah. be able to have enough space to maneuver around. Wow. Yeah, it's a it is a tricky balance. Bathrooms are not made to be the most filmmaker friendly, but you know, if you get creative, you can definitely do it. Yeah, just you know, bang out some walls, you know. It, you know. <laughs> yeah, just squeeze in. Exactly. Yeah, make curved walls instead of the not 90 degree angle walls. Exactly. Uh, but um, lastly, um, I, I do want to ask, um, you know, the obvious question. Uh, what do you hope audiences take away from watching this uh, short at Tribeca uh, 2020? Yeah, I love this question. So the main message of our film and honestly, what I hope audiences take away from watching it is to just be confident in their choices, no matter what anyone else has to say about them. You know, in any space, whether it's their sexual choices or any of their choices in life, you know, it's your life, it's your decisions. And as long as you feel comfortable in them, it's really important to not let the opinions of anybody else define them. And additionally, I kind of hope that it sparks people to start opening up more about their experiences, is talking with people about them, starting a conversation about sex and shame that hasn't really been talked about that much before. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, with that said, uh, Callie, thank you so much for joining me. And the show times are or screen times show times whatever you would want to say uh if you're in new york uh, you can catch it on friday june 7th at 19 p.m at amc 19th street Monday, june 10th at 8 45 p.m at the village east angelica saturday june 15th at 8 30 p.m at the again at the amc 19th street and a final screening on sunday june 16th at 9 15 p.m also at amc 19th street um i'll have a review um this week i believe yeah, I think June 7th or June 8th, somewhere around there. So look out for that. And then obviously, I have a bunch of interviews coming up. I just recorded earlier today an interview with the cast and crew behind Mars. Uh, that was a really fun interview. And a bunch of other Tribeca coverage you'd probably expect, you know. So yeah, uh, thank you again, Kelly, for joining me. Thank you so much. This is great. And your questions were so fun to answer and really insightful. So thank you. Yeah, no problem.